Thanks very much. I would uh, argue that uh, all of you are using our products today at least 400 times a day, and in the very near future, you're going to be using at least 4,000 of them. What we manufacture are antennas, and uh, the genesis of the company was 41 years ago in Israel, and our biggest client in our mobile division is Samsung. So we make all the antennas uh, from the 3G, the 4G, the Wi-Fi, the near field, the Bluetooth, all within uh, the Samsung phone. Do about 200 million antennas for them every year. In terms of who we are, uh, roughly 40 million shares outstanding. Uh, based on the closing price, our enterprise value now sits at about $180 million. And based on consensus forecasts, uh, I like to put up the valuation rate up front. We're going to grow roughly uh, 15% uh, from 2018 to 2019, and our EBITDA should uh, see uh, likewise a larger increase on the bottom line. Relative to our peers, you can see on the bottom there, in terms of the, they're all U.S. peers, Comscope, T Connectivity, these are all multi-billion dollar companies. And uh, we're finding that we're, because we are a niche player, we continue to gain market share against these players. In terms of uh, our business units, uh, I won't go into great detail. We do have four operating divisions. Depending on the antenna we have, from the smartphone, where it's a roughly a dollar of content per phone, and we produce uh, for Samsung, mostly for the Galaxy uh, series, but they also have tablets, laptops, uh, wearables. So that's a good, steady business for us. Uh, in terms of where we see, oops, excuse me, where we see the growth is really on this side of the business. Uh, what I'll mention here is satellites. We acquired two companies in Montreal. Good steady, steady business for us. Think of DirecTV or any military application where there's, uh, or even uh, soldiers that re require remote connectivity. We uh, manufacture the antennas and all the hardware that will connect uh, from, the, from the uplink right to the downlink. It's all uh, earth, earth station things. Uh, the most exciting part of our business is right here on the, two, on the right. And this is infrastructure and embedded antennas. So from the, uh, the technology we have in smartphones, we adopted that and made larger antennas. So the antennas in the Samsung phone go for pennies. Total dollar content is roughly a dollar. But now, uh, buildings like this require repeaters on the inside. That's, called it, uh, that's what we call an infrastructure antenna. We have the same thing that goes on the outside. So these antennas range between $200 to $1,500. This is one of the biggest programs AT&T has in terms of densifying their 4G network. We are the, one of the largest contributors to that program. Going one step further, now we're getting into the base station market. Cell phone towers are growing very rapidly within the U.S., uh, expected to grow from 400,000 towers to 600,000. You need roughly 20 antennas per, and we just launched a new base station product uh, earlier, later, excuse me, later in 2018. In terms of our management team, uh, I'll just point out two people, uh, well, three people. Jeffrey Royer, he's uh, our chairman, single biggest shareholder. He owns 50% of the stock. He's been uh, involved in the company for at least uh, three decades now. Good, good steady shareholder. Uh, our CEO, <coughs> excuse me, joined the company as vice chair uh, 10 years ago. He took over the role about uh, six years ago when we uh, needed to change how we were addressing the market. He's done a phenomenal job on refocusing and pivoting the firm away from mobile, which used to be 80% of our revenues, or Samsung was, now to only 20% of our revenues, primarily because of the growth in the other business units. The last person I would highlight here is David Saska. He's the, our newest addition to the board. He comes, from, come to, comes to us from AT&T. He was our network design engineer for them, designed all their networks for the last 30 years, retired. He's our first addition uh, outside of that is non-Canadian, and we want to continue to push this agenda with uh, more non-Canadians on the board. What I like about this slide here is on the bottom, if we, if we can't buy the companies, we are, what we're finding now is we're hiring a lot of our competitors. So the three gentlemen at the bottom, Mike Moon, he was the president of mobile at Samsung. He now runs that division for us. Jerry Kirschman here, he, we hired him from a primary competitor out of Ottawa. Uh, this is a company that was doing 100 million in revenues, grew from zero in three years. We're now replicating that same success with his team. In fact, because of his hire, we hired his entire R&D team. And lastly, here on Advantech, John Restivo, he's the, he runs the satellite operations for us in Montreal. Same thing, we hired him out of a primary competitor in the US. We, he brought over his sales team and his key R&D guys. So we're now taking market share pretty aggressively from all their peers. So where do we, how do these sectors stack up in terms of where we sit? Mobile antennas, as I suggested, the ASPs are quite low, so as a result, the margins are low, but it is good, steady cash flow business for us. On the satellite business, 
Uh, I don't really believe that number, 16%. The satellite industry is uh, probably growing much slower than that. I would say single digit, but we are growing faster than that because we are gaining market share. But what, what we really like is the last two divisions, much significantly higher gross margins, 40 to 45%, uh, but the growth rates are also significantly higher. In fact, our, our infrastructure antennas last year grew 100%. Uh, we don't expect that kind of sustained growth rate, but the programs that we're seeing in the U.S. I think will carry us through for at least the next decade. The last thing I would point out here is embedded antennas. That refers to things like set-top boxes, Wi-Fi routers. All of us have those at home. We make those antennas. Where we're seeing a lot of growth now is, is in IoT, but specifically cellular IoT, which we refer to as CIoT. CIoT is about 10% the size of the IoT market. This year, roughly 11 billion IoT devices have shipped. Roughly 1, 1 billion of that is in the CIoT domain, and we're starting to see a lot of traction in that, in that end market. A great example would be we just won a contract with an OEM to, get, to replace the fin antenna on the top of cars. That's a 3G, 4G Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi antenna. We've now made it flush-mounted, so that would be deployed with an automotive OEM later this year. A lot of discussion about what's happening with 5G and where do we sit in 5G? How do we get exposure to 5G? Just so you understand in terms of what is happening, if you look at the topology changes over the course of time, 1G was an analog uh, uh, topology. 2G really opened up texting, but it was really not till 3G and 4G where we got broadband connections. Everyone thinks 5G is required for more broadband, but that's only one component of it. What we find is, what we're finding with our, our customers anyway, the more important uh, attributes of 5G is really has to do with latency and that decreasing the latency from roughly two to 300 milliseconds for 4G down to now promises of one to 10 milliseconds opens up a whole new area of, of development. AR, smart cities, uh, these types of things, autonomous driving, those will require near real-time communication. And the only way for cars to really know what's on the road is if they start talking to each other. The antennas will be required both in the car uh, they'll be basically moving base stations, but also at street level. So we're developing both of those antennas. My point here is, with regards to 4G, even though everyone likes to talk about 5G, we're still very early in the development cycle of 4G. I, we believe, based on what our carriers are saying, that 4G will continue to be a massive investment for AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and, and the Canadian carriers as well, uh, in terms of growth opportunity. 5G is just emerging. We just launched our first, we just won our first 5G contract. It was a competitive situation. It was with a European OEM going to a U.S. carrier. This is a massive MIMO. It's called multiple in, multiple out. This antenna is largely about the size of this podium. It has an array of 16 by 16 antennas, and it's a lot more capabilities than we've ever had before. So a lot of intelligence is coming to the antenna, more software, higher ASPs, electrical tilt, mechanical tilt, and we're developing all those antennas. We won that uh, just recently. That'll be launched in the back half of 2019. In terms of why we also like the 5G market, because you're going to millimeter wave, the propagation is very small. In here, if you have a 4G antenna, you can easily cover this entire uh, seating area. With a 5G antenna, it literally becomes a spot beam. These millimeter waves are very narrowly focused. So when you hear about AT&T and Verizon saying they deployed 5G in any, any jurisdiction, be very careful. What literally happens is they put an antenna on top of a, a lamppost and you'll have to physically stand under that lamppost within a five foot radius to get any kind of signal. What, so the use case today is really not there for the consumer. It's going to be for enterprise. And so what we're going to see is a massive increase. We say five times more antennas, I think it's going to be closer to 10 to 20 times more antennas required in 5G versus 4G. And the, it's going to be the enterprise that will do it. Anything that wants, that they need to be tracked in terms of automation, in terms of vehicles, machine to machine, in the factory, all that type of stuff is going to happen. Within 5G, the spec now is for, to support 1 million devices per square kilometer. That's one device per square meter. 4G only supports 1,000, so you're going to see a massive increase in terms of number of devices, and that's where I think the carriers will start to win. They'll grab a lot more of the subs. So why, why do we, where do we sit in terms of 5G opportunity? We have now that first design win. We will be establishing the standards. This will put us roughly 18 months ahead of our competitors. Uh, we will continue, continue to reiterate these designs as we have with all our other antennas and continue to capture market share because of our fast innovation. 
quick snapshot on our financials. As I suggested earlier, that the, we did have a bit of a financial turnaround several years ago. As you can see, for the next uh, three years, these are all based on consensus forecasts. We have a 20% CAGR on the top line, expected to hit 165 million in revenue this year. Bottom line is growing much faster. Well, on the EBITDA basis, growing at 70% CAGR for the next three years, or two years, excuse me. So over here, we talked about Samsung being a big customer. So back in 2016, there were 40% of revenues. Because of, and that red bar is, or the red bar right here, that's Samsung, relatively steady quarter on quarter. Where you're seeing the growth is in the gray bars, and that's all the new customers. We've gone from 100 customers when Samsung was 46% of our revenues to now 850. And we continue, again, to, to gain more customers, but also bigger pieces of their, their uh, allocation. Gross profit and trailing 12-month, uh, likewise, are, are showing the same uh, benefits. So why invest in Balin? And I'll conclude with this. If you want to look for a company that has exposure to one of the biggest investment cycles in 4G, which people don't talk about, that is with Balin. AT&T and Verizon will continue to spend billions of dollars on their network infrastructure. AT&T, for instance, has won something called FirstNet. This is a multi-billion dollar program over the next 20 years where they will be uh, providing nationwide coverage for fire, police, and ambulance. Absolutely new network, and we are playing in that space. Uh, in addition to 4G, we have 5G. So we've won our first product, and this will provide next legs of growth for at least the next 20 or 30 years. So what I would say, conclude with is there's a lot of momentum with our organization right now. We are gaining market share. We're winning new customers. We're accelerating product development. We continue to win new mandates, and we're looking for more acquisitions to continue to position ourselves for 5G. All at the same time, we're still, I believe, both intrinsically and fundamentally inexpensive relative to peers and, and relative to our fundamentals. So with that, thank you. Appreciate your time. <laughs>